So again, when it is that we are um, having too many of those inputs, that is really going to be outsourcing the job of the microbial community. And then that community is not going to flourish and grow and be very active. Another way in which we can assist in the regeneration of soil is by looking at how we're going to stimulate more of these exudates, not just to help to get uh, nutrients from the soil, but to get those nutrients from the soil to address various needs that the plant has in response to stressors. And so the plant will give off these exudates if it needs to get those resources from the soil and if there's a stress event that happens. And utilizing both microscopic and macroscopic livestock or organisms that are going to somehow stress the plant is a way of being able to do that. So on a macroscopic scale, you have livestock and you can use grazing animals. Wildlife can be a way of uh, injuring or stressing the plant. You can have birds, bats, insects, all of these different types of organisms can put some stress on the foliar tissue of the plant. And what I mean by that stress is they'll do a certain amount of wounding to that leaf tissue, to that foliar tissue. As animals, including us, are walking through fields, we will oftentimes damage part of the leaves. As birds and are uh, flying through fields or as they may rest on part of the plants, that is also going to be something that is going to put a certain amount of stress because there are plant cells that are going to be injured in that process. And so any injury to the plant cells, to the foliar tissue, whether that happens from grazing or that happens sort of incidental from other animals is going to result in the plant needing to basically wall off those injured cells and then either keep them walled off or to be able to restore and rebuild the injured part of the cell wall and be able to address those issues. The compounds that are needed to be able to do those activities are going to be complex biomolecules polyphenolics and antioxidants. In particular, antioxidants are cell wall stress biomolecules. They help to reinforce the cell wall structure and respond to those stresses. So if we want to increase the amount of antioxidants that the plants are producing, one of the ways in which we do this is by stressing the plants. And so when we've got this, these stress events that are happening, we want to be able to, what the plant will do in response to that stress is it will give off more exudates to the roots and to the microbial community to then require that microbial community to free up more nutrients that are needed for forming um, those antioxidants and polyphenolics and other phytochemicals, including both macro and micronutrients. When you have an animal that's doing grazing, that is a large amount of stress that's happening to the plant tissue. If you have an animal like cattle, they're gonna be grazing, they are going to pull and tug at the leaf tissue. That's also going to pull and tug at the roots and shear off root hairs, which are also gonna stimulate again, more exudates going out to the microbial community. So what we're really trying to do is enhance the activity of the microbial community in response to these stress events. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we talk about each of these, these principles and some specific types of tools and practices we can put into place. Reducing or eliminating tillage or soil disturbance. We want to be able to look at how we can manage the system to make sure 
that we are addressing some of the issues that we might have with, uh, in particular, weed management. But we don't want to, we do want to do this judiciously if we're going to be utilizing tillage as a tool so that we're not doing too much damage to the soil environment itself. And what happens with soil disturbance, and soil disturbance can come from tillage, it can come from equipment um, driving over the landscape, it can come from uh, animals, including uh, large grazing herds of animals, and how that hoof traffic and how the, the weight of the animals is going to be disturbing the soil. So it isn't entirely that we need to have absolutely no ever soil disturbance. But what we need is we need to look at how we can manage soil disturbance judiciously. When we do soil disturbance, what that's going to be doing is that is going to be impacting the soil structure, the uh, physical weight that can come from equipment or from animals on the surface can cause the soil structure to collapse where you have pore space that is going to um, be reduced, that open space in the soil and cause greater levels of compaction. By reducing that, that weight physically compressing that pore space, you also can have the destruction of soil aggregates, those pellets that are in the soil that actually can help to enhance the pore space and will be utilized in those aggregates where you're accumulating um, organic matter, uh, sand particles, silt particles, clay minerals, all of these soil components into these pellets where bacteria and fungi can utilize what's in those pellets to provide for the fertility to the plant. And so when we have soil disturbance, in particular by tillage, that can physically destroy those aggregates. In addition, tillage can also physically destroy the hyphal networks that may exist below ground, in, uh, hyphal networks that are created specifically by the mycorrhizal fungi to act as a, um, <clears throat> pipeline or a conveyance system delivering those nutrients into the plant roots. And the other thing that we can look at is how we're going to be protecting the surface of the soil, wanting to have that armor that's on the surface of the soil. A lot of times people talk about crop residue as, a, as the armor. But an even more important armor actually comes from living plants. The shading that you will get from the leaves of living plants that is going to be providing that protection uh, from solar radiation by shading the soil surface. You're going to have uh, the leaves of the living plants that will absorb the energy from wind and water to make sure that that energy is not disturbing the soil surface and having a negative impact. The explosive force of raindrops hitting bare soil is actually diffused by coming in contact with residue or with um, green plant leaves. In addition, that those green plant leaves and the crop residue, but it's best having that armor at least come from, for, for quite some time, coming from the living plants because that armor is again providing that protection to absorb the energy. And at the same time, it can also help us to manage water at the surface and near surface. What you have is you can get an increase in condensation or dew that can be happening underneath those leaves or underneath the residue. So if you've ever had a large um, residue mulch mat on the soil surface and you stick your hand underneath it, it will actually be moisture under there because of that condensation that's collected. And the condensation is coming 
not just from water that may be evaporating out of the soil surface, but also from water that's released by the biological activity of the microbial community and by plant roots. All organisms go through a respiration process. And aerobic organisms that are at the surface of the soil, as well as the plant roots, are going to be taking in oxygen and giving off CO2 and water, water vapor. And that water vapor, it can be cycled continuously at the surface or at the near surface by those activities of condensation when you've got that shading that's going to help to moderate temperatures and providing a, 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 a barrier to reduce the loss of that water vapor or evaporation of water out and out of the uh, profile that you have in that environment. So we wanna be able to look at, again, how we can use these various types of tools and practices to address the principles so that we can regenerate soil, so that we can get more carbon going below ground. And when we think about these tools and practices, one of the ways in which we can evaluate which tools or practices we want to use and how we're going to go about utilizing them and when we're going to go about utilizing them is to apply the FIST acronym. And what this is, is thinking about the frequency, intensity, scale, and timing of those uh, practices and tools where we're gonna utilize that to evaluate or create a pros and cons list. Every action, every tool and practice that we put into place is going to have a reaction. One of the issues that we've had in where, how we've addressed our agroecosystems is we haven't thought about the reactions that happen as the result of the actions that we're doing. We think about it as addressing a particular issue or need that we have, but we don't think about all of the pros and cons of what those tools or practices do. So in doing that, again, applying this acronym helps us to think about and evaluate that pros and cons list and figure out what the trade-offs might be. So we're gonna do an exercise where we're gonna think about this in regards to tillage. So one of the things that, that we know with tillage, as I talked about, is that tillage has cons and the cons of tillage are uh, its destructive process to the fungal hyphae and destruction of soil aggregation and increasing, so that's gonna help us to increase compaction. It also is where we, depending on the tillage tool you use, that may cause the displacement of the microbial community that's at the surface or near surface and move that microbial community away from the surface or near surface where it would have normally been interacting in the rhizosphere with the growing plants and in an aerobic area to a potentially anaerobic area uh, quite a distance away from the actively growing plants. And so that can reduce its effectiveness if you're doing any type of inversion, uh, which is often a component of uh, tillage. So we've got those as cons. Now, if we think about the frequency of those cons, if we do tillage more frequently, if, if what we're doing actually, the tools and practices that we're gonna use is going to require us to do very frequent tillage, that is going to increase the number of cons that you might have. So we do tillage, the pro is to address weed issues. You have the list of cons. If you do a lot of frequent tillage to address the weed issues, Every time you do it, those cons are going to be happening. 
So could we modify the intensity of the tillage that we're doing? So changing our tillage tools, so we may not do as much of a, a deep inversion. We may not do the um, intensity oftentimes is, is sort of the amount of power or force that's behind the tool that we're using. So some of the things in which we can modify intensity with tillage is um, changing the tools that we're using so that it's not uh, moving through and having a lot of very strong impact on the soil itself. So as we uh, are utilizing various types of tools, if we use those tools at a higher speed, that can have a greater level of intensity than if we are doing tillage at a slower speed. So it's that level of force that could be involved in there. So does just changing the speed of the tool we're using, is that going to be enough to address the issue we have to comply with our pro? And at the same time, by reducing that speed and that force, that may reduce the amount of soil destruction that that tillage tool is having. It may reduce not all of the aggregates are automatically going to be destroyed or the hyphal network completely destroyed by the tillage tools that you're using. If you use those tillage tools at a very powerful, strong rate, a very high intensity, that may have a greater level of impact on soil aggregation and fungal hyphae. Now, scale is thinking about the volume of soil that you're disturbing. Different tillage tools can have different levels of scale on the volume of soil that's being disturbed. Again, if you're using a plow that has does an inversion process, the whole volume of soil that was impacted by that tool, because you may be taking a large volume of soil and just inverting it, the volume of soil that was actually impacted directly by that tool may be fairly small because it's just that part that was inverted at the, at the uh, surfaces of the inversion. What's inside may not have been as impacted by the tool that you're using. If you use a, a tillage tool um, like a, a rototiller, that is going to be able to have much greater amount of scale, the volume of soil that's actually impacted by that because the tool is going to come in contact with more of the volume of soil. So where the tool comes into contact with is that scale that's gonna be impacted by that particular tool. So we're talking about different types of tillage implements that could be used here to modify our scale, modifying the speed at which we use those, in, those tools and somewhat modifying the, the different tools that we choose, the different implements that we're choosing can affect intensity and scale. Intensity is, is more uh, going with the speed um, and timing. So we wanna be able to utilize tillage when it is going to be most effective at addressing the issue that we're trying to address, which is looking at managing weeds. But we wanna also be thinking about the timing when we could have the least amount of impact on the actively growing microbial community. So if we want to reduce some of the impact on the uh, hyphal networks, we may want to be looking at doing tillage at a time in the year in which they're not going to be actively growing so that we're not having that, that level of impact in the hyphal network. But we also want to look at how that timing may impact some other things like the increase in um, erosion. So if we're gonna do tillage at a time when the microbial community may be less active as we're going into the fall or winter, is that also setting us up for a time in which by doing that and reducing the armor and protection on the soil surface with tillage, 
that we're now going to have that soil be more susceptible for a longer period of time because we're gonna have a longer period of time without the armor in which it could be susceptible to erosive forces. So all of these things are things that you're thinking about in how you're going to look at your tillage tool. Now, one of the things that we find, I find with the microbial community that can have the greatest amount of impact is the frequency. Because with the intensity and scale, that is something in which we don't know for sure we can modify some things with intensity and scale that are actually going to um, reduce the amount of impact on the soil microbial community, the amount of contact with the hyphal networks and the destruction of the soil aggregates. But frequency is where you're thinking about the fact that that frequency, the more often that you end up having to do it, that is going to cause those cons to be happening every single time. And so I think about this from the perspective of the mycorrhizal hyphae, the mycorrhizal fungi growing in the soil. Every time you do tillage, you have the possibility of ripping off one of my limbs. I'm a, I'm a mycorrhizal fungus. So you're gonna start, you're gonna destroy part of my body. So you're gonna rip off one of my limbs and or you're gonna destroy my house. And if I have time, I can take the carbon that comes from the plant, the plant exudates, and I can take that carbon and I can regrow those limbs and I can rebuild my house. But if I'm constantly in a limb regrowing or house rebuilding process, because once I get that done, you come, up, you come and you use tillage again, and that happens again, I don't have enough energy and resources to actually really do my job. Every time you do tillage, you have the possibility of destroying part of my body and destroying my habitat. And if that keeps happening repeatedly throughout the growing season, I don't have enough energy. I have to put all of my resources that I get from the root exudates into regrowing my limbs or rebuilding my habitat, rebuilding my house. And my house are those soil aggregates. So if I have to keep doing that over and over again, it's hard for me to have enough resources to do the job, which is to provide fertility to the plant. And if I can't do my job, then the plant isn't gonna pay me root exudates. And so I'm gonna have fewer and fewer resources to rebuild my limbs, to rebuild my habitat and regrow my limbs. So frequency can have a larger overall impact than maybe intensity and scale. And so it may be that I have to use a deeper tillage tool or I have to use a different tillage tool to actually eliminate my, pretend, my, my weed issue. So if that tool that is maybe of a greater scale, it may impact a larger volume of soil, or I may have to use it at such a rate so that I have more power or intensity or force on the soil in order to be able to eliminate that weed issue. But if I do that, if I increase the scale and intensity, but I utilize the scale and intensity to reduce my frequency, more often than not, that's gonna be to a greater advantage because that is gonna allow, even though a greater intensity or in scale may do a greater amount of damage one time, I'm only doing that damage once and then my frequency is far reduced. So I don't have to go back and do tillage multiple times throughout the season or even on an annual basis. Could I then do tillage 
uh, once every three to five years rather than every year. As I reduce that frequency, that gives more time for the fungal network that may have been more destroyed by that single event to actually rebuild the network. And it gives more time to rebuild all of the soil aggregates that are important components to what's happening. So I'm looking at modifying the frequency. I'm looking at modifying the intensity and scale so I can reduce the damage of the frequency. So when you think about, again, that cons list and what the frequency, intensity, scale, and timing, how that applies to that cons list, you can then make choices on making sure that overall you've reduced the amount of negativity that's going to be happening with these various types of practices or processes. So when we're really trying to, again, increase the amount of plants that we have growing, we're looking at doing some innovative things, looking not just for new plants that we could include in these cover crop mixtures, but also looking to maybe some uh, more native or indigenous plants that have been here that are more adapted to growing in these regions. I talked about things like relay cropping, double cropping, poly cropping or intercropping, being able to have the plants growing, actively growing at different times. One of the things in increasing this maximizing photosynthetic um, activity is basically looking at trying to keep the plants growing, but it doesn't mean that we need to be having the plants in um, growing through their full life cycle. In fact, when the plants are in the vegetative phase, they're putting more carbon below ground than when they're in the reproductive phase. And so what we really wanna do is we wanna increase this carbon economy the carbon flowing below ground to feed the microbial community and doing that by keeping plants growing for as many days as we possibly can. Um, back in 2019, I did a, I, I currently live in Calgary, Alberta. And back in 2019 with a colleague in Alberta, we did a, um, what we called a winter green challenge. So we asked, uh, people that wanted to attend a workshop in March. We started this in November. We asked people that wanted to attend a workshop in March to send pictures between November and March of where on their farmscape they could see green plants still or find various types of green plants. Um, there's recent research that's looking at how much solar radiation can penetrate through different depths of snow. So could we still have photosynthetic activity if we have um, snow cover, but that snow cover is not very deep? How far down does that solar radiation penetrate for us to continue to have photosynthetic activity? And we need to be thinking about this because we have microbial activity that can be occurring even in the Canadian prairies almost every day of the year. I had a colleague a number of years ago who did a, a project um, in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And Grand Forks, North Dakota is one of the coldest places um, on the continental North America. And the reason is, is because Grand Forks is basically at the intersection of, it's almost at the very center of the North American continent, north, south, east, or west. You, you cross as you go to Grand Forks, depending on the direction you're coming from, you're gonna be crossing continental divides. And so when you're at the very center of a continent, you don't get the um, temperature moderating climate that you would have coming from coastal areas. So you're so far away that you don't get any of those temperature modifying climate impacts from those coastal areas. The other thing that runs you run into when you're at the, the center of, of um, the North American continent is 
the latitude that Grand Forks sits at. So yes, you may have things that are higher in um, higher up or uh, higher in latitude, but those are actually closer to those moderating temperatures from the coast. So you don't have as cold of sustained temperatures as you would in the Grand Forks area. So what she did was on a uh, potato farm in Grand Forks. So you had very little cover on that potato farm in Grand Forks. She would measure uh, indicators of microbial activity various types of gases coming off of the soil surface. And what she found was that even at um, temperatures that were in the atmospherically, that were in minus 20 to minus 30 Fahrenheit, uh, you had active microbial activity happening in the soil. So pretty much every day, of the year, you have microbial activity happening in the soil. These microbes will go into various types of microsites inside soil aggregates or inside soil or inside plant roots, where they will have physical protection from some of the temperatures in the soil. So even though you may have frozen soils, you still have a place where the microbial activity can happen. And for those microbes, they need to be getting food directly or indirectly from the plant. And so if we have microbes that are eating food 365 days, but we're only going to be feeding them for 90 to 120 days, because that's the maximum we think that we can grow plants in the prairies, we aren't going to have very good activity of the microbial community because those microbes are going to be starving. And so what we really want to have is increasing the number of days that we can feed that microbial community to offset the fact that they are growing 365 days. And they may not be as many of them growing all of those 365 days, but you still have activity that needs to get fed. So when we did this winter green challenge from November to, to March in 2019 to 2020, what we found was that uh, the uh, attendees for the conference sent in pictures that at least one person had every day pretty much covered from November to March. And this was in Alberta, that they would go somewhere in the province of Alberta. There was someone who was able to find a green growing plant. And when you think about that, it gives us again, a lot of options and opportunities to be able to be extending our growing seasons not to be defeated by the weather that is that we have in the Canadian prairies. The other thing that is really important for us to be thinking about when choosing our plants is that plants do not sense temperature in the same way that animals do. Plants do not have a nervous system. So they do not have that sense of the impacts of temperature on their foliar tissue. What happens with plants is they're basically utilizing that foliar tissue to have contact with sunlight. So as long as the sun is passing overhead, that's the resource that they need to be able to harvest as well as contact with CO2. So as long as you have the, those two components, you're actually able to do photosynthesis even at very cold temperatures. What the plants will do is you have plants that are adapted to different temperature regimes in which their biochemical reactions can be occurring at different temperature regimes at optimum levels. So what we're looking at is Sorry. really focusing on that. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Excuse me, Dr. Nichols. Yeah, we've got about two or three minutes left and then we'd like to take some time for questions. So. Yeah. If, uh, if you got a few final thoughts, um, that would be great. Yep. So I, I kind of wanted to spend a lot of time on focusing in on, on this whole idea. But 
And I'm going to skip to this. One of the things that I want us to also be thinking about is this whole idea of um, nutrients versus water. Because we've had a lot of water issues um, during the last couple of growing seasons, one of the things is, is it drought stress? Is it water stress or is it nutrient stress? And when we work with the biological community, as these two plots that were side by side shows, that when the biological community is providing the fertility to the plant, that fertility that is provided to the plant is actually helping the plant to grow, even though there may be a low amount of soil moisture. So soil moisture is used to help to transport nutrients from a concentration, from a high concentration in the soil to a lower concentration in the rhizosphere. When the soils are dry in the height of summer or in the early fall, as the soils are dry because we have less precipitation during those periods of time, it is harder for those nutrients to be transported to the plant roots. So what the plants will do is the plants will give off water in the rhizosphere to create a diffusion gradient to try and get those nutrients to move to the plant roots. But if the rhizosphere is instead filled with active microbes, that zone around the roots, the movement of nutrients from way outside of the rhizosphere into the rhizosphere, that need is lessened because the microbial community is actually working within the rhizosphere to provide those nutrients. And so the plant doesn't have to give off that same amount of water to create that mass flow. So in the conventional corn that you see here, what ended up happening was that we had, at this particular location, we added conventional fertilizers um, to this nitrogen and phosphorus and NPK, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium at the recommended amounts. But then what ended up happening was we had some rain in the early spring that, um, caused many of those nutrients, including the phosphorus, to run off or to leach out of the rhizosphere, the root zone. And then as the season progressed, we didn't have any more precipitation. So the plant started to exhibit drought stress on the conventional side because it didn't have access to enough nutrients and it had to give off more water to try and attract those nutrients to the rhizosphere, whereas the organic corn didn't have that happening. So when we're thinking about these various types of managements of nutrients, including the microbial community in how we're gonna be actively addressing this is critically important to managing water. So with that, I wanted to end it here and if there are any questions. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up in the chat here. Um, the first one is from, uh, from Ken, and he's curious if there were any specific species that were active over the winter, any typical cover crops, or, or did you look at specific species when you were uh, evaluating um, some of that photosynthesis over the winter? So um, there are a, a couple of different species that are going to be uh, more frost tolerant or going to be active over winter. Um, things like uh, turnips and radishes and winter canola may be included. Um, you can also look at including things like uh, um, some of the um, rye uh, that would be more frost tolerant as well as uh, utilizing things like winter wheat um, or other um, plants like that that are going to be frost tolerant and are going to be some, doing some active growth. One of the other things that we found with this winter green challenge was that um, for uh, some of the producers that had livestock and did some things like bale grazing or um, a, they had, um, a, a, uh, I can't think of it, where, where you had a certain amount of cover on the, the soil surface with um, uh, crop residue, 
that underneath there, you could then, as that residue was removed, you could see more plants growing because that residue was actually helping to keep the surface soil temperatures warmer for a longer period of time. Okay, that makes sense. Um, next question we have here from um, said he asked, so in the context of green manure, uh, is used the use of a biennial plant and then mowing it down instead of plowing, um, would that kind of fulfill some of the objectives that we're trying to achieve? So I, I guess along yes. the lines of reducing tillage, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, definitely um, utilizing mowing or grazing to manage biennials or even perennials um, as uh, understory or green manure crops, um, both understory crops during the, your cash growing phases, but also as, as a green manure. A lot of times when it comes to green manure, um, we've the pressure has been to incorporate that green manure in order to be able to get the nutrients that are there. And the reason that we've thought that way is because the green manure is uh, the way we've evaluated the amount of nutrient, the nutrient credit that the green manure can provide is what's in the biomass above ground. But we don't think about that biomass below ground. And when you, when you do that, that biomass below ground, as well as the biomass above ground, when you do the tillage, you're basically then um, going to increase the decomposition rate and the turnover of those nutrients that were in that biomass. So if you are gonna be doing things like uh, tillage of your green manure, you really have to look at the timing of that because you're gonna get that very rapid flush of nutrients from the decomposition of both the above and below ground biomass. And if you're not gonna utilize that by your um, cash crop very quickly, then that is just wasted. And again, what, what we're starting to find is that there's so much more going on below ground with the microbial community and their biomass and what nutrients they have left in there as well as the plant biomass that's below ground that if you just mow um, it off or graze it off, that is going to be more profitable in the end on being able to manage those nutrients there and not get that rapid flush and loss of fertility, but actually keeping that fertility um, throughout the, the growing season. Makes sense. So it kind of slows down the release of, of, of nutrients. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I think that makes sense. Well, it's 10 o'clock, um, so I think we're gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chris, for your time and for, for a, a great presentation.